It's the one place in Las Vegas where the beauty of nature goes more than skin deep. A variety of volunteer opportunities help cultivate community. It takes some very creative chefs to satisfy these Vegas diners. And there are many more stories at the Springs Preserve where all that matters is what's elemental. Aristotle said the aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance. Local artist Robert Rock Beliveau has taken that idea and literally magnified it. His work unveils an otherworldly panorama of fascinating shapes and colors found deep beneath the surface of some of our favorite fruits and vegetables. In his chosen profession as a pathologist, Las Vegas resident Robert Rock Beliveau has spent nearly four decades peering into microscopes, amazed by the wonderful dynamic world of cellular structure and organization. He was so enthralled by this magical microcosm, his daily nine to five didn't provide enough hours for this exploration. So he set up a lab of his own at home and nightly immersed himself in researching life at its most fundamental level. Over time, the glorious beauty of these layers of life began to capture more of his attention, so his endeavors gradually moved from the purely scientific into the realm of art. I find it very interesting, it's very beautiful, it's a nice melding of science and art, which a lot of folks don't think those two disciplines can necessarily correspond, but of course they can. And what I find so interesting about it is he would put the juices of rhubarb at the same time on various slides and incubate them over the same period of time, and yet they all look totally different from slide to slide, even though they came from the same fruit or vegetable, and even though they had the same incubation period under the same conditions. In order to share the results of these discoveries with the world, Beliveau invested in some rather sophisticated imaging equipment and began making massive prints of these microscopic images, many of which are now featured in a show filling the Big Springs Gallery here at the Springs Preserve. The exhibit kind of looks at two different things. For one, we take a look using the polarizing microscope that focus in on parts of plants. So for example, the exterior of cucumbers. You may not realize it, but the little bumps and ridges have a purpose, so maybe it helps to prevent uh, pests that might feed on the cucumbers. And then other ones uh, might be a close-up of a tomato seed or the inside of some red pepper. And then the second part of the exhibit, really the bulk of the exhibit, looks at the idea of self-organization. So the artist found that if he cut fruits and vegetables and left the juices uh, pretty much at room temperature on slides, over a period of time, he would find that crystals within the juices would self-organize over time. So a lot of them might be an eight, nine month period, and they might go from little specks and they start to kind of come together and basically over time self-organize into these beautiful abstract shapes. While many people take images through microscopes, Beliveau's training and experience as a pathologist introduced him to a process whereby he passes light through a polarizing filter, which coaxes out very specific frequencies, revealing spectacular colors and shapes otherwise unseen. This is what they look like under a polarizing microscope, and under each particular image, we indicate its magnification as well as its light source. So there really isn't much manipulation of the photos going on. What he sees under the slide is what we're seeing here. Once visitors see the astonishing amount of activity taking place at the molecular level within very common items we handle and consume on a daily basis, it's not surprising they'll probably come away with a renewed interest in examining their macro world in a more micro way. Years ago, I had an old roommate in college that would say something like, slow down, stop and look at the flowers. And whenever I go on vacation myself, um, I'll oftentimes spend time not looking at the large picture, but kind of looking at the little things. What is going on in this weird spider web off at the corner? What's under this rock? Um, at the shore? Is there some cool critter or something like that? To me, that's as interesting as the big picture, these large monuments, these large mountains, because a lot of people tend to miss those things. 
Beliveau's work proves there's more to this world than meets the eye, and this exhibit encourages visitors to emulate his process by taking a two-fold interactive approach to investigating this majestic microscopic world. You know, there's two ways to look at this particular exhibit. One, when you first walk in, uh, beautiful pieces of abstract art, and then if you dial it down and take a look at the label copy, we talk about some of the science behind how the art was made, as well as what's going on with the plant, and in some cases, the insects that are preying upon the plant, and even how we as human beings interact with the plant. So there's a lot of different things that we're talking about in the exhibit, and I suspect that when visitors come in, they're gonna take away many different things from it, depending on, on what they're interested in. Discover the incredible defensive skills of some of nature's coolest animals live at Nature's Ninjas, the Springs Preserve's newest traveling exhibit. From hedgehogs to scorpions and tarantulas to poison dart frogs, you'll experience incredible hands-on interaction with some of nature's most misunderstood animals and uncover how these amazing creatures defend themselves against predators. And the fun of the exhibit continues with a live animal show. Nature's Ninjas Live, held daily inside the Big Springs Theater. You'll learn from the animals' zookeepers how these ninjas of the natural world use their special skill sets to hunt for prey and protect themselves in the wild and witness many of these adaptations for yourself. The exhibit and show are free for members or with general admission. It's your coolest ticket to escape the heat. The original founders of the Springs Preserve were encouraged to dream big, to hold nothing back when conceptualizing this place. They were also challenged to think beyond the physical facility, to build more than mere structures. Their mission was, in fact, to cultivate community. When we first opened the Springs Preserve, we called it your desert playground. We called it Central Park of Las Vegas. And after a couple of years, we took a look at who was coming here and who we really needed to reach out to. And it was the community. So we decided to create a place that celebrates that culture, that community, and brings people together. As the dream became reality, the prodigious scale of it presented a daunting challenge. Just how can we field a team large enough to run this place? We were gonna need a lot of help. And the people who help us the most are our day-to-day -day volunteers who come to us anywhere from two to four times a month. They help greet our guests. They make sure they know that they are safe and comfortable while they're here, find their way around, and have a generally good time. That symbiotic relationship became the embodiment of our mission. As much as we wanted to give to our community, we found a reciprocal passion in the people who freely donate their time to make this dream a reality. We cannot run the property without our volunteers. We have a dedicated staff, staff passionate about this property, about the mission of this property, and our volunteers also are passionate about this place and the people who come here. So we really appreciate them, and I believe that they really appreciate being here too. Now, after more than 10 years of operation, our community is thriving. From Las Vegas natives to new residents, from kids who've grown up with the preserve to seniors who love being a part of an active, vital lifestyle. Our volunteer base is more vibrant than ever, and we've developed the program to offer more ways than ever to become a part of this gratifying endeavor. There's basically three different ways you can volunteer for us. You can come as an individual, where we'd like to see you anywhere between two to four times a month. The other way you can volunteer for us as an individual is to come as a track two or an intermittent. And that's just like it sounds. It's an intermittent opportunity. When we have special projects, when we have um, group projects, we put out a call to all of our intermittents and we ask them to come and help us with maybe just a quick service project. Volunteering for the Springs Preserve doesn't have to be a solitary activity. We have lots of ways for groups to come together for team building activities or to simply get out of the office and enjoy our natural surroundings. A lot of our community partners come to us and they want to do something with their team. Say they work in accounting and they are indoors all day long. They'll give us a call and they'll say, listen, we're doing a team building project and we'd like to give you two hours in the gardens. We just wanna be outside. Can we help you plant something? Can we help you rake up something? Can we dig something for you? And it's a chance for them to come together as a team. Or you can form a group. 
You can come with five like-minded people. Again, you need to be over the age of 14. You need to have a team leader. And then you come and help us as a community partner for Haunted Harvest, Dia de Muertos, Holiday Express, Black History Month Festival, uh, the Ice Cream Festival, all those fun things. And then you're on property in a group with your friends helping us run those operations. And there's no need for prior experience. After a quick application process, we start with some introductory training, a familiarization tour, and before you know it, you could be wearing that famous vest. The general information session is just a good chance to get an overall view of the property. It's 180 acres. It's a really good chance to meet the property, understand where your opportunities are for volunteering. If you're over the age of 18, we're gonna run a background check. Once that clears with no discrepancies, we're gonna give you a call, one-on-one -on -one orientation, and then get you right into your first shift. And more often than not, it will be a shift doing something you have a particular interest in doing or learning more about. When people let us know what their interests are, we try to find them something because that keeps them engaged too. We don't always have the opportunities, but we will listen always and try to find a place to make it a more enjoyable experience. It would be very difficult to find a more fun yet gratifying way to become a vital part of our cohesive community and to extend that connection with guests that perhaps recruits them into our family as well. I think our volunteers are the face of our property as much as our staff members are. And they really, really make that connection with the guests who come here. And it's special. It's special for them and it's special for us and it's special for the guests too. We kick off our fall festival season with two exciting events in September. We get things growing with our semi-annual plant sale on Saturday, September 15th. This sale features rare, native, and desert-adapted plants you won't find anywhere else. Then on the 29th, you can sample fine wines, a unique selection of beers, and great food from some of Las Vegas' finest restaurants while helping to raise money for a good cause at the Springs Preserve's annual Grapes and Hops Festival. These events are very popular, so make your plans and reservations today. For more information, go to springspreserve.org. It's a common refrain around here, especially among newcomers, that it's impossible to have a vegetable garden in the desert. Well, our staff gardeners wholeheartedly disagree. In fact, they tell us we have some distinct advantages. You can garden here in Las Vegas. If you just bought a house here, you just moved here from different parts of the country, you'll realize that we can garden here year round. Cool season crops, warm season crops. Admittedly, we don't have the best native soil for vegetables. So the first step in starting a garden is soil supplementation. The soil is the most important part of your garden. So if you really invest more in the soil and get that ready and alive, then you can add whatever you want to plant. I would say start small. You can do containers. You can also do raised beds. And then that way you can control the soil and the watering and the exposure of it. Raised beds are very popular here in uh, Las Vegas. You can get it up off the ground. You don't have to dig this hard, hard soil. You know there's good drainage. Set your irrigation into play and make your raised bed so that you're able to reach into the center of it and get around it and maybe put a, a little edge on it so you can sit down and harvest your vegetables. One great advantage we have here is more suitable months for gardening than much of the rest of the country has. But you do have to get the timing right to make the most of them. Timing is really critical here to get your crops in the spring in early enough before the heat comes in. Uh, you should not plant in the middle of summer, in the heat of the summer. That will set you up for failure. Uh, wait until fall to put in your cool season crops. And no one will consider it cheating to enlist the help of a few natural allies. Worms are not indigenous to the Mojave Desert, so we do have to get the worms. These are red wigglers. And then we also have some uh, African night crawlers because they seem to do okay. I put scraps in there from my garden or from my kitchen and they eat them. And then what comes out is this beautiful, rich soil. I also have other little critters growing in there, but that's all part of the decomposition and what makes it really rich. 
Las Vegas receives less than four inches of rain a year, so proper and sufficient watering will be crucial, especially to nurse those plants through our blazing hot summers. You should have a good drip irrigation system. Cover that with a nice mulch. That's going to help retain the moisture and keep the soil cool during the, the heat of the summer. Long hot summer days might not seem conducive to anything regarding gardening, but they're actually a great time to plan for the fall season. But both our experts agree, don't plan too big at first. I think sometimes people think that an edible garden means like it's just acres and acres of food, but you can just have a container like a whiskey barrel or something and have some greens and some other things in there and you've got some edible things happening there. These are just a few ideas to get you started on creating your own produce section right in your own backyard. We think you'll find that gardening in the desert will be greatly rewarding, especially when you have such tremendous resources available here at the Springs Preserve, along with eager gardeners ready to help you with any and all your questions. There's always a gardener available here at the Springs Preserve to help you and answer questions if you do need help. The cooler days of autumn are a perfect time to get in your yard and put in that garden you've been dreaming of. And we're offering classes to help you plan and prepare. From growing vegetables and attracting wildlife to landscape basics and container gardening, we've got a class for every interest. And for our most enthusiastic Desert Green Thumbs, we're launching two five-week garden series in September on natural garden design that will cover everything needed to assess a site and design a garden using nature as your guide. Classes fill up fast, so go to springspreserve.org to learn more and register today. We're really fortunate to have such a wide variety of native species living with us here in the Mojave Desert, but their survival instincts discourage human contact, so it's unlikely you will ever see many of these creatures in the wild, especially when they're enjoying a meal. So we've set up a sanctuary here at the preserve to provide a more certain opportunity to view these fascinating creatures and learn more about them, their habitat, and yes, even their diet. We have desert cottontails, we have gray fox, we have kangaroo rats, we've got a plethora of lizards, <laughs> some geckos, snakes, rattlesnakes, um, tarantulas, desert hairy scorpions, all those fun guys all of whom serve as ambassadors for their species and habitat, teaching us the importance of taking better care of our desert home in order to better live in harmony with these native neighbors. But as stewards of these creatures, we're responsible for their care and keeping. And making sure they're happy and healthy starts with the question, what's for dinner? We have a variety of different eaters here. So we have some um, omnivores, which means they eat everything, you know, meat and vegetable or plant material. We've also got a lot of herbivores. We have insectivores as well, so animals that eat primarily bugs. So really we have um, the chance to make all sorts of different kinds of diets. So we have to make sure that what we're doing is fitting our diets to that animal's natural diet in the wild. Feeding this many critters with such varied dietary needs requires a smorgasbord reminiscent of a well-stocked Vegas buffet. Fortunately for us, most of our diners don't eat with the same frequency as the voracious Vegas tourist. We make diets every single day. Uh, what changes is kind of who we make the diets for on a daily basis. So the mammals, obviously, we all eat every day, right? So the mammals in our collection get fed every single day. Where it changes is when we get to our lizards and our invertebrates. Our reptiles, like our herbivorous lizards, they only get salads three to four days a week, and then we'll have them ready for them. Our animals, like our rattlesnakes um, and some of our non-venomous snakes that only eat every other week or once a week, we only prep their food every couple of weeks. Also, very much like tourists, our guests really appreciate dinner with a show. With some of our bigger animals, like our mammals, we'll do some enrichment with their diet. So a lot of the times for the fox, we'll put his food inside of empty toilet paper tubes and crush the ends up and then put that inside of a box and then put that inside of a bag and then hang it on a tree so that they have to rip it all apart and forage for their food like they would in the wild. We might also sprinkle it all around their exhibit. So I may take a handful of kibble and just toss it so that he has to go around and look for all those little pieces of kibble and eat. Because in the wild, obviously, nobody's going to walk in and hand him a bowl of food on the ground. So we want to give him something to do and keep his brain happy, too. 
Happy and healthy, we take great care to assure proper nutrition. Our zoologists are specially trained and have several years of experience with our native species. They also consult with veterinary staff and even other facilities to be certain our critters are getting the specific vitamins and nutrition composition that they need. We really do make an effort to mimic as much of the natural diet as we can, but obviously that's not going to be possible in a captive setting. So where we can't actually mimic it, we'll make sure that the vitamins and the nutrients that they're getting in the wild are what we are feeding them here. And sometimes we may need to use supplementation to do that. But just as we were beginning to get comfortable in our roles as animal chefs, we were presented with a new challenge three years ago when we added our highly anticipated butterfly habitat. We also provide food for them, and so we've got an amazing garden staff that plants all the food that we have in there, the flowers that nourish the butterflies, but we also provide kind of an extra um, little supplemental nutrition and that's with the little dishes that you see in there with cut up fruit and then we actually put Gatorade in those so it's a sugar water kind of mixture which is what butterflies eat their nectar eaters so that just allows us to provide just some supplemental food and they've also got running water via the fountains that we have at both ends of the exhibit and a lot of times you will see butterflies sitting on there drinking water you can see them with their low proboscis unfurled drinking water out of the fountain so we definitely know they utilize that as well. It's a complicated job to assure all our living collection animals are properly and specifically fed well and cared for. But it's also very gratifying because these diners are always eager and happy to see their meals arrive. Our fox gets real excited in the evening and, and I'll walk up and folks will be like, oh, he's super excited right now. And I'm like, yes, I have his dinner. <laughs> and he knows, he knows it's dinner time and people love to watch them get fed. All that makes the Springs Preserve a great place to learn and play also makes it a great place to meet or gather for a private event. From the intimacy of our garden terrace and patio, which offers panoramic views of the Springs Preserve's botanical garden and the bright lights of the Las Vegas Strip, to the unique historic streetscape of Boomtown 1905, where you can enjoy dancing under the stars or dine among some of Las Vegas's iconic storefronts, we have the most unique venues in town. And whether you're looking for a romantic setting for a wedding, a conference room for meetings, or anything in between, the large variety of spaces at the Springs Preserve can easily accommodate your event needs. The distinct setting, attentive staff, and a variety of menu options through our own Divine Events Catering make the Springs Preserve the perfect location for a successful and unforgettable event. For more information, call 702-822-8779 or fill out our venue rental request form at springspreserve.org. Summertime is the time for casual fun foods to go with picnics, family outings, or a quick evening treat at home. And there's no better choice for fun than that all-time favorite, the Sloppy Joe. But before you reach for that pre-packaged spice mix, Chef Cicely wants to show you how to bring some personalized zing to this classic treat. Today I'm going to be reinventing a tried and true favorite of my childhood summer days, Sloppy Joes. But because I'm a big kid now, it's going to be a little bit of adult version of Sloppy Joes. So I've got a pan here, I'm making sure it's nice and hot over to a medium high heat. I'm going to just warm up a little bit of canola oil and when that oil starts to shimmer, I will know it's ready for me to add a little bit of red pepper flakes for a slight just kind of frying action and then I'm also going to add some resinous herbs including oregano and also some rosemary and once those get a good little sizzle on and I can start to smell their wonderful flavor I will add some ground beef I want all of these flavors to meld and to combine so I'm breaking up that meat and something else I'm kind of allowing it to do on purpose is to let the meat brown and stick to the bottom of the pan a little bit. That's going to create a fond that I'm going to deglaze and it will add some amazing depth and flavor to this dish. Let's give that a little bit of a turnover. This process is pretty quick and I want that meat to brown 
all the way through so that I don't see any pink, but I definitely don't want it to get dark brown or to get dry or to get tough. So now I have a nice rendering of the beef. Everything is to a nice brown, so I'm just gonna drop this temperature real quick so I can pull it away and I'm going to simply drain off the grease and the extra fat. So I'm just left with my nice lean beef. This pan comes right back onto the heat a little bit lower now. There we go. And my first step is a little bit of red wine now. And I'm gonna use that red wine to break off any particles big or small, that are still stuck onto that pan. All right, we got a good, nice deep glazing, got a little bit of a reduction going. So I'm going to add some onions, and I'm gonna allow those onions to sweat until they are translucent, which means I can slightly see through them, and uh, they're aromatic, so I can smell them. This step takes about two to three minutes to sweat those onions to exactly where I want them. My next step is going to be adding on top of that some diced celery, some diced bell peppers, and some diced red peppers. If you like a little bit of crunch in your sloppy joe, by all means, let this step take only one or two minutes. If you like everything to be soft and of a similar texture, let it go five to seven. And next step will be a touch of tomato paste. I'm gonna spread around that tomato paste and let it fry and sear in the pan. That's gonna give it that kind of rusty brown color instead of a bright raw red tomato color. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is re-add this now very lean ground beef that has my herbs and my peppers all seared in with it. And in looking at this sauce, what I see is it looks a little bit dry, yeah? And Sloppy Joe's, well, gosh darn it, they're sloppy. So I need some liquid to really loosen this up. We are using a little bit of chicken stock and then some pureed San Marzano tomatoes. That's going to loosen this up perfectly. Last but not least, I do want a bit of sweetness. I'm going to do that with some molasses. This is going to simmer for about uh, five to ten minutes until it starts to pull in together and pull tight, but not be dry. I don't, definitely don't want it to get over dry. And then our next step will be to get this going on a plate. My Sloppy Joes are going on some little brioche slider buns. To keep that bun nice and soft, I'm spreading it with some creme fraiche. And then a lovely amount of this sloppy concoction, a little bit of microgreens. And we are ready for an outdoor or indoor lovely summer meal. My name's Chef Sisley. Thank you for joining me at the Divine Cafe at the Springs Preserve. I hope to see you here. Have you ever wondered how archaeologists do their jobs or what local archaeological projects are going on around town? The Southern Nevada Archaeology Speaker Series held at the Nevada State Museum is here to answer your questions. From preserving archaeology through photography to identifying bones, the series celebrates historic preservation in Nevada. Get all the details and find event dates and times at nvculture.org. There's a lot more to discover, so join us next time here at the Springs Preserve, where a microscopic world of wonder Varied volunteers and our well-fed native critters mingle to bring new life to Las Vegas.